just to let you know, most of the people here are members of the Shackle Area Social History Group. We bring speakers over and um, we like to see some, uh, we, we invite visitors in to hear the speaker. So Richard Grayson's been over a few times. His talk today is on the Dublin, the Great War. He's done various talks with us. Um, it'll be about 45 minutes and then after that there will be time for questions and he has a book for sale as well so um, I'll leave him, leave him to it. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, last time I was here I was talking about um, my book uh, Belfast Boys which I now realise was published 10 years ago, almost this, this week um, and I still get invited to talk about that book. Um, and uh, it's, it's good to sort of carry on engaging with people in, in the area that that was written about because uh, although it was called Belfast Boys, it was actually about West Belfast, it was about Shankill and the Falls. Um, today I'm going to talk about Dublin's Great Wars. Um, I'll give a plug. My friends at No Alibi's Bookshop um, are always very happy to provide copies of, of my books for talks and they've, um, they've sent me with copies today to sell. Uh, they're usually £20 for a hardback, um, but there's a discount today, um, they're £17 if anyone wants one of those at the end and of course it can be signed and, and all the rest of it. Now, um, Dublin's Great Wars, First World War, the Easter Rising and the Irish Revolution. Um, I, I didn't come to this subject as, a, as someone with a particular interest in uh, the Irish Revolution. I came to the subject of the First World War as, as someone doing their own family history because my, um, both my dad's parents were from Lurgan in County Armagh. Um, I had two great uncles uh, in the Ulster Division. Uh, I had another one who uh, was killed in the Second Royal Irish Rifles in September 1915 at Hooge. And um, that was on my grandmother's side. My grandfather who grew up at Kinigo, just outside Lurgan, uh, was in the Royal Flying Corps and then the Royal Air Force in, uh, in the First World War. And he was then in the Home Guard uh, in England. Uh, he'd moved there just after the First World War and the Second World War. So he saw service in, uh, in um, two wars. Uh, he didn't contribute much to the Second World War other than accidentally helping to blow up the London to Birmingham railway line when the Home Guard were on exercise. Uh, they, uh, they decided that it would be a good idea to try and hit a moving target with a Stokes mortar uh, and hideously overshot. And that bit of the London to Birmingham railway line, the Luftwaffe had actually tried unsuccessfully to uh, blow up, but the Boxmoor Home Guard uh, managed to do it. And it, from everything that he said, it was rather like... Um, it was rather like Dad's army, but he had a he had a very different First World War, obviously, and and being um, being the Flying Corps actually was was quite fortunate to survive because the fatality rate was quite high. Um, I moved on to Dublin after having worked on uh, Belfast for many years because it seemed like it was the obvious next thing to do because it would be quite different um, and a publisher suggested to me that, that looking at the story of Dublin soldiers in a way that hadn't been done before uh, would be an interesting thing to do but inevitably as I'll come on to say that involved looking at the crossovers between um, the First World War and the Easter Rising as, part, as a wider part of the wider Irish Revolution. Before I talk about what I've found, I think it's always worth thinking about, you know, what is, what is it, the, the, the bare bones of what people know about um, the First World War and that period? And if you just take Northern Ireland as a starting point, then it strikes me, and you've only got to look at murals around, around this area, that still the most known part of um, this area's contribution to the First World War is the men who were in the Ulster Volunteer Force and then enlisted in the 36th Ulster Division and then of course went off 
uh, to the Somme and, and uh, other battles as well during the war. There has been, I would say, over the last <coughs> 20 years or so, uh, because of the uh, work of groups like the Sixth Connaught Rangers Research Project, um, there's been a, a growth in knowledge of men uh, from the Falls and from Short Strand and from other areas who are Irish National Volunteers and uh, joined the 16th Division. And we're also on the Somme, though at a different stage of the battle. Uh, there's a clear knowledge of the Ulster Division um, suffering very heavy losses on the 1st of July 1916. Um, and then 20, more like nearly 30 years ago now, you start to have uh, some understanding that the 16th and 36th Divisions had a had at one point fought side by side at Messine and that of course led to the um, uh, Island of Ireland Peace Tower, Peace Park at Messine and some sense that, that these men who came from quite different backgrounds at home were in similar places doing similar things at similar times. So when I started uh, working on Dublin I, I had to think about well, what's the What's the very basic understanding of Dublin's First World War? And of course, probably, not probably, but certainly, the, the dominant narrative that people have is not around the war at all, it's around the Easter Rising. It's, it's what happened in Dublin uh, during the conflict um, that was separate to the First World War. If you go below the surface a bit more, there's an understanding that there were the so-called Dublin Pals, who were formed from rugby players initially, um, although they drew in many who weren't rugby players, but D Company of the 7th Royal Dublin Fusiliers of the Dublin Pals, and they suffered very badly at Gallipoli. Um, they were covered partly, they were covered in the media a lot more than other Dublin units because they were a very middle class unit. So um, they were known to the people who owned newspapers for example. Some of them were journalists but um, they, they were known to newspaper proprietors and wealthy businessmen so they got coverage that actually working class Dubliners largely in the 6th Royal Dublin Fusiliers, in just as large numbers, didn't get coverage. But that's, that's a dominant part of the narrative. Um, I think there's some knowledge around the city that maybe soldiers in Dublin found it difficult uh, to have been in the British Army after the war, as the Irish Free State was established. You didn't necessarily want to advertise the fact that you've been in the British Army, although that's actually far more complicated because there were often very large parades of veterans in Dublin. There were so many of them that it would have been hard to victimise them. Um, there was some knowledge of the National Army that the Free State set up consisting in, in large part of former British soldiers. And then uh, again in the 90s, ab ab about the, the, the time that people started, people here started talking about the scene, you had what I, I call um, the Irish Voices approach. Miles Dungan, the journalist, and also uh, Tom Burke, uh, the um, Royal Dublin and the Royal Dublin Fusiliers Association, started telling the stories of um, ordinary Catholic men from uh, from Dublin and, and much wider areas in the South, uh, telling their stories in ways that it hadn't been possible to tell uh, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s. What is the book about? Um, Belfast Boys was about part of one part of two parts arguably of one city. Um, Dublin I was a bit more ambitious and decided to do the whole, not only the whole of the city, but the whole of the county. So this is a big area. I'll come on to some actual numbers a, a bit later. I was clear from the start that that would have to involve looking at 
military service very broadly defined. Um, so not just military service in the British forces, but also in Republican forces. I've covered some politics and I've covered the home front as well. Um, I used broadly the methods that I used for Belfast Boys, which was going through pensions records, um, service records, and newspapers, as well as things like church memorial rolls. But um, the thing that you, the, the bonus source that you have for doing a, a study of Dublin is that the uh, IRA pensions records uh, are available online now and obviously cover very many people from, uh, from Dublin and uh, also the witness statements produced in the 1950s uh, which are problematic in lots of ways because obviously people always want to talk up their role you know there's the old saying that there were um, uh, 1500 people in the general post office in Dublin during the Easter Rising of whom 40,000 survived uh, <laughs> and wanted to, wanted to have some claim to have been there but they're a really good source and they're online and the um, the Irish government has taken the approach that these things will be free to use online, which is a real boost for um, uh, for researchers. The British government has has been a bit more money grabbing about want, wanting money for people to access their relatives' records. Um, so, uh, some statistics. What did I find? Um, I managed to identify 25,000 Dubliners, city and county, who had served in the British military. But uh, we know that that's not all of them because uh, so many records were destroyed in the London Blitz in 1940. The Arnside Street Depository was, was uh, burned, uh, which was bombed. It was there was fire and there was also water damage in putting out the fire to records and in fact two-thirds of the service records were lost now a lot of the men you can find in other ways you don't need their service record if they died for example they're on the Wargraves Commission website um, but I estimate that probably 10,000 service records for Dubliners were lost uh, which means that I reckon around at least 35,000 Dubliners serve, and there's obviously some officers and naval air and air service men whose, whose records are hard to find as well. Of those 25,000 in formal British military, that's Army, Navy and Air Force, all but 20 were men. Um, I found around 6,500 that I could verify as being dead, and I got queries over another 600 or so more. These would be people who were uh, reported in newspapers as dead, but you can't find a, a, a war grave record for them. Um, often this is because people have spelt names differently, uh, and, and that can cause, cause huge problems. I also, a real bonus now, since I did Belfast Boys, I wish this source had been online when I did that, but the, the British Red Cross records are online and, and free to use. Um, you can, what most people, you just go in and enter a name and most people go in and type in Vera Britton and they will find her record, which is an interesting thing to look at. But there are 4,000 Dubliners, or nearly 4,000 Dubliners, who volunteered for the Red Cross in some way or other. Uh, and 90% of those are women. So more than I was able to do for, um, uh, for Belfast, I was able to look at the story of women in this. And they would range from people who are going to the front as voluntary aid detachment nurses, or they might be people who are at home and preparing packages of, of uh, things for soldiers. Um, the sphagnum moss, which is much valued as a medical dressing, uh, that's largely gathered by Irish women um, during the war. Now, in terms of Republicans, using the various Republican records, um, I found nearly 1,900 men from Dublin with some service during the Rising, 
and over 200 women. Um, in addition, uh, I found 481 Dubliners who were arrested but had uh, no apparent rising connection. Now this is, this tells you something uh, about the sort of sledgehammer that was perhaps understandably used by the British authorities after the rising, that, um, but also how it might lead to bitterness among Dubliners who were, who were arrested um, just because the police were a bit suspicious of them but they had actually no connection to the rising. A small number of those um, are people like Owen McNeil who were active Republicans but in McNeil's case had actually tried to stop the rising um, from taking place. He, he thought it was, it, it was wild and, and likely to, to lead nowhere. But most of them seem to have had no rising connection and of course people are always very keen in the free state to claim a rising connection so I'm pretty sure that, that almost all of those were wrong, wrongly arrested. Um, numbers as well um, at the stage of the Anglo-Irish truce in 1921 there were five and a half thousand people almost all men serving in what was by then the IRA's Dublin Brigade. So there are large numbers of people who are involved in what they would see um, as some kind of military activity. I've got data on um, uh, recruitment, when people joined, um, the kinds of units they were in, casualties. One of the things I, I gathered um, for Dublin was information on tattoos because service records include uh, a description of tattoos that people had and I think these are really interesting in indicating um, people's loyalties in some ways because they will often record that um, uh, uh, men joining a, had, would have a tattoo of say a crown and a shamrock. Um, a, a, or some kind of British symbol and some kind of Irish symbol. Sometimes it's initials, sometimes it's flowers, women's names, the usual range of things. Um, but I found, um, I think it was around 400 pieces of recorded information of, of the tattoos that, that Dubliners had, on, and um, they're, they're in the book. I, I looked at social class. Um, I had a hypothesis that to be um, a Republican would probably mean that you were a bit better off, um, a bit less desperate for money, because obviously you're not being you're not being paid um, until the latest until War of Independence at any rate, and then not across the IRA, you're not paid for being in Republican forces. Um, and I did find that um, Republican in Republican ranks about a quarter of the men were defined as being unskilled compared to 40% in the British Army as a whole and, and over half in the British Infantry. Um, and there is a sense that the Republicans are more middle class um, or at least uh, white collar workers uh, of some type compared to the labourers who are in, in British ranks. Um, that said, there is a division between some units. So, for example, 10% um, of Royal Dublin Fusiliers are, as a whole are in white collar jobs. But the 10th Commercial Battalion, as it was called, 50, nearly 50% 50 of them were, were in, uh, in white collar jobs. And they were, frankly, the, the 10th Commercial Battalion strikes me as a little bit snooty that they were actually men who joined up wanting to serve with men of, of what they regarded as their own type um, and didn't want to serve with working class people. So um, you can see cla the class divisions of Dublin. Um, Dublin, of course, at this point is often described as being the second city of the British Empire. Um, you can see all the uh, class divisions of of the UK as a whole reflected uh, in the units that men people join in the Royal Dublin Fusiliers.
in the book, uh, bearing in mind that that, na- that Dublin narrative I said was largely about the Easter Rising and the and the and the, and the Dublin Pals. What I've tried to do is offer a, a new narrative um, of the First World War. In the first place, the book actually begins with the South African War, the Boer War, because it struck me that some of the issues that would come to the fore during 1914-18 were being played out uh, in South Africa in 1899 to 1902, and I'll explain why a bit later. I wanted to look at um, Dublin's traditions of service in the British military. Um, I wanted to look at the army beyond the Dublin Pals. Also considered Dublin loyalism, Irish Parliamentary Party nationalism. Um, what was going on while the Easter Rising was taking place, and then also think about crossovers between the war and the rising and the wider war of independence. And I'll explain each of those a bit more now. First of all, um, the context of the wider imperial and political conflict. I found um, two men, um, one Tom Burnham, one was Michael Tracy. And um, if you head forward to uh, the Easter Rising, they, um, uh, or the month of the Easter Rising, they both played quite different roles in that. Tom Byrne is in the GPO uh, in Sackville Street, as it then was. Um, he's known as Boar Byrne, uh, for reasons I'll explain, B-O-E-R. Um, he married um, Lucy uh, Smith, who was one of the women in the general post office, and their daughter, Agnes, I think, was one of the people who very much figured in the commemorations of the, um, of the uh, centenary of the Easter Rising in Dublin. And he's a well-known figure in the Easter Rising. Michael Tracy is not known at all. Um, Michael Tracy was killed at Hullock uh, in, when the Dublin Fusiliers there were gassed uh, during the period of the Easter Rising. Uh, he was a working class man from, from Dublin. Both of those men had been in South Africa in 1899 to 1902. Tom Byrne was with the Boer forces, the Irish Transvaal Brigade, who, who volunteered for the Boers, and Michael Tracy was in the Royal Dublin Fusiliers. They might have come up, up against each other on the battlefield in um, uh, uh, 1899 to 1902, but they're certainly on different sides in different places in <coughs> Easter 1916. And for me, the, the different journeys that those men took in and around Dublin and off to South Africa and then off to Hullock and Easter Rising and so on, shows that this um, conflict that takes place in Dublin in 1916 is not just about Irish independence. It's about a conflict within the the British Empire, that people within that empire have different loyalties and express that in different ways. Now Dublin, uh, moving on from that, Dublin is a city with strong military traditions. If you think of the Anglo-Irish ascendancy, the centre of that is Dublin, um, and therefore it's unsurprising that that city and its people would have a strong connection to uh, Brit- the British military in all sorts of different ways. I was really struck in the first instance, I, uh, when looking at an area, I was trying to think, who's the first and the last fatality in that area? When, when was the first person killed in the war? And in fact, Dublin has a fatality uh, on the 5th of August, 1914, which is when the first British fatalities occur And they are on the HMS Amphion, which um, uh, hit a German mine in the North Sea, and most of the crew was lost. They're actually in action the day before, on the second day of the UK's war, but Pierce Murphy is killed. And so there's a Dubliner killed 
in, on, the, on, on the very first day that there are British losses, um, and he's, a, he's naval, and that reflects Dublin's place, obviously, as a port and a major naval centre. Um, it is a place with str throughout the war with strong connections to the um, Royal Flying Corps and then the Royal Air Force. In fact, there are three brothers, the crew as Callaghan's, who were all killed serving in the uh, Flying Corps and the Royal Air Force. In incredible loss for a family um, that is obviously very closely connected with the Royal Flying Corps. You also have, um, we always talk about the volunteer battalions going off uh, to war and we focus on the fighting in 1915 and 1916, um, but we mustn't forget the regular battalions. When war broke out, the first um, British Army units action were in action were full of regulars and reservists. Uh, the men who were already serving and the men who'd agreed to go into the, into the army if war um, broke out. And so Lakato, which, you know, if you ask um, members of the general public with uh, general interest in the First War, it's probably not the first battle that springs to mind. It's a, it has very, very heavy losses for Dubliners uh, in 1914. Now, thinking about the, um, the POWs, the Dublin POWs dominated Dublin media coverage of the war um, because they were, as I said earlier, a more middle class and perhaps in a, in a few cases an upper class um, battalion. But there is so much more to the story of the Royal Dublin Fusiliers than simply this, this one uh, part of, of one battalion. First of all, the first Royal Dublin Fusiliers are in action in Gallipoli um, in April 1915 and suffer very badly and they're at Gallipoli uh, for most of the uh, period of the campaign. But alongside the 7th Royal Dublin Fusiliers is the, um, is the 6th Battalion. Um, they had far fewer connections with the, um, with the press um, because they were much more of a working class battalion. But we are very fortunate they, that one of their officers, Noel Drury, who was from rural County Dublin, and is pictured on the left, left a really detailed diary. His diary is um, about 200,000 words long. I only know that because I'm editing it at the moment for the National Army Museum, who are um, publishing it um, with the, with the um, Army Record Society to mark the centenary of the disbandment of the Southern Irish Regiments. It's a really interesting diary and just tells you a lot about the experience of Dubliners at Gallipoli and then at Salonica and then they went to the Middle East and then they were briefly uh, on the Western Front at the end of the war. Now, if we think of Belfast, we, we know that Somme is the key battle for the city. But that's different for Dublin. For Dublin, it's Gallipoli. And I think one sign of that is that during the uh, War of Independence, there's a particular area of the city centre where, which the IRA um, have completely sewn up, actually. It, it's a terrible place at night for the British Army to go. They're regularly ambushed by the IRA, who are very much embedded in the local population. And so it becomes a place of um, becomes a place of slaughter, really, for the British Army. And local people in Dublin call it the Dardanelles because their idea of um, a place where British soldiers get killed is Gallipoli. Had that been in Belfast, that area would have been referred to as the Somme. Wouldn't have been referred to as the Dardanelles. But that's really telling that the. That the that the battle that makes an impact on the, on the minds of, of Dubliners is, is Gallipoli and that's because you have the regular soldiers going in in the first phase in April 1915 uh, and then you have the volunteers who are in the 10th Irish Division going in in uh, August 1915 and that's the 6th and 7th Royal Dublin Fusiliers um, and others. All of that said, um, I, I'm, I'm 
I haven't ignored the Dublin Pals uh, at all in the book. There is quite a lot on them. And I particularly focused on, uh, on this man, uh, Captain uh, Robert Callaghan. Uh, these are pictures from the Royal College of Surgeons archive. Um, and he was one of the men treated by the famous early plastic surgeon, uh, Harold Gillies. And what happened, Callaghan was serving at um, Salonica and he got hit on the side of the head there by a bullet which went through his head, behind his eyes, uh, um, narrowly missed his brain, if you think about it, but just went through his eyes and destroyed his, his eyes and his optical nerves. Um, and he was, he was left without any eyes and couldn't see. So over the course of 1919-22, he had a um, series of procedures, some of them dental as well, um, to, to deal with problems with his, his jaw, affected by the bullet coming out um, on that side. Um, it's a really interesting story, I think, because um, at some point, the, uh, he was advised by the hospital um, that he could apply for a higher level of benefit than he was receiving. And this prompted the War Office to look into his case. Um, I've listed him as captain there. Um, under War Office rules, you had to have been a captain for 15 days um, uh, it, of being when you were wounded if you were to get a higher level of benefit than a, than a lieutenant would. And Callaghan had only been captain for 10 days. So some bureaucrat in the war office said, actually, we've overpaid you and we'd like the money back. Um, he was distraught. Um, they, we're talking of thousands of pounds in today's money. Um, actually, I think I estimated it as something like he'd been overpaid by about 14,000 pounds. Um, he enlisted the help of his former Member of Parliament, uh, who was by then a member of the House of Lords, Edward Carson. Um, and Carson wrote to the War Office um, and largely got it sorted out. Um, they actually ended up not clawing, clawing any money back from, uh, from, from Callaghan, although they did pay him a bit less going, going forward. Um, he married. Uh, in 1921, uh, so you wonder who this woman was. Uh, was she some somebody? Was she somebody that uh, uh, that he he'd known before and had stuck with him? Actually, she was from England, and interestingly, on the marriage certificate, her um, father's occupation is recorded as surgeon. So I wonder if she was the daughter of somebody who treated him, but I've not been able to establish, establish that. But I think it's quite a touching story. And records later on in his file, in the late 1930s, show that he'd had a daughter, um, and also that um, in 1938, during the Munich crisis, he had qualified as a medical masseurs, and he wrote to the War Office offering his help for wounded soldiers should there be another conflict. Um, there's no evidence that that, was, that that offer was taken up, but it is there, and he died um, in 1946. Richard? Yeah. You see the way you mentioned there about the reconstruction? Yeah. Um, surgery and work done. Who paid for that, and how did people get the criteria? You know, somewhere they have yeah. disfigured. How, how did how do people get, get that surgery? It's, pay, it's paid for by, by um, the hospital, which is receiving both state and <coughs> voluntary contributions. So you could describe it as a kind of early form of the National Health Service. Um, but it's not something that the individuals themselves would have, would have had to pay for. Um, but I, I mean, given there's probably tens of thousands of people mm. that have expired, you know, how, how are they able to say to would everybody been able to feel that or? Uh, it was open to, uh, it was open very widely. Um, 
I did find some people who were assessed and just decided not to go through the treatment. They just couldn't face the idea of being pulled apart even more. Um, so certainly not everybody um, uh, opted to have have the treatment. I also think, you know, and the thing is with the um, Royal College of Surgeons records, we, we only know about the people who got to that stage. And that depended on them being referred there by somebody in a in a in, in a local area. In his case, he he'd been back home in Dublin. So without full access to all the medical records, we we won't know the answer to this, but I think there must have been people who were referred, who probably were less needy than others who weren't referred, just because that's the way it works sometimes, isn't it? So, um, and there might have been people in certain hospitals who were more sympathetic and, and so on, but we can't really put numbers on it, but theoretically it's open to everybody with this kind of, with this kind of wound. Didn't that happen in the Second World War, it was brilliant? Yes, it's um, Max something, I can't remember his name, that's right, yeah, and, and they, they build on work that's, that's happened, um, that's happened in, the, uh, in the First World War. I mean, the interesting thing about, um, about some of the procedures he had, I, I think, is that arguably what ended up here in March 22 looks a bit worse than it was in February 22 but this is designed for actually how he felt and the functionality of it so you know they would have found if I recall correctly they, he actually had trouble closing um, his eye in a comfortable way not that he actually needed to close it but of course you, you still want to um, and, and so they had to do had to do more work to allow, to allow that so he's an interesting case, I think. Um, Dublin loyalism. Uh, we don't think of Dublin as a loyalist hotbed. It, clearly there are lots of unionists there. Um, very much in the Anglo-Irish establishment. Um, but there's also, uh, there's a group in Dublin pre-war called the Loyal Dublin Volunteers, who are a Dublin equivalent of the Ulster Volunteer Force. Uh, there are a couple of thousand of those men. They're signed up essentially to the same pledges that the UVF were. They were ready to do what the UVF were ready to do, had home rule been introduced. Um, when war breaks out, they decide they want to serve in the Ulster Division. And so they head north and they um, join the 9th Royal Inniskill and Fusiliers and there is specifically a Dublin company uh, w which is, um, it's not a very good picture unfortunately, but that, those are men of the Dublin company and there's a couple of hundred of those and it means that just as the Ulster Division is in action on the 1st of July um, 1916 and that has a very important part in the history of the UVF uh, <coughs> it's important in the history of the Loyal Dublin Volunteers as well. Uh, and so there's very much, I think historians can sometimes overblow the extent to which stories are forgotten and not known about, but I really think that with Dublin loyalism, this is a forgotten story. Um, it's going to be hard to tell it very more because the LDV didn't, didn't leave records in the same way that some UVF units did. But they're there and, and, and they're, they're part of the 1st of July 1916 um, and partly because of that all, for all I've said about men being um, killed at Gallipoli in large numbers if you are to take a single day of the war what is Dublin's worst day of the war in terms of fatalities it is the 1st of July 1916 and that's because Dubliners are on the Somme some of them there as regulars some of the Dublin uh, the Lord Dublin volunteers uh, and so on. So, you know, it's, it's Belfast's worst day, it's the worst day for the British Army as a whole. It is also, and I think this surprises people, Dublin's worst day of the war in terms of fatalities. Some of the Dubliners who were in action on the Somme uh, were in the um, 
16th Irish Division and they're in action in September. Because of all that's said about uh, the Easter Rising uh, and because of what that means for Dublin be being and becoming a Republican city, I think we forget the strength of Irish Parliamentary Party nationalism in Dublin prior to the war. They are absolutely dominant politically, uh, the Redmondites. Um, and that means that somebody like Tom Kettle, uh, former nationalist MP, who's a journalist at the outbreak of the war, uh, is an iconic figure, killed on the Somme in September 1915. Um, Kettle when the rising happens is very much torn, um, still feels a strong loyalty to serving in the British Army, but also can see that the rebels have done something that will probably change opinion. And he says to a friend soon after the rising, well actually soon after the executions, he says, those men are going to be remembered as heroes, I'll be remembered, if I'm remembered at all, as just another bloody British officer. And that's Kettle's take on how things have changed. But for him and, and, and his, his uh, political comrades, Dublin is a nationalist city, not a Republican city prior to the war. And that's why the 16th Irish Division um, recruits there. And that's why a young man called Emmett Dalton uh, joins the 16th Division uh, in 1915, and I'll come on to him uh, a little bit later. Uh, I thought it would be interesting, one of the questions I was interested in was, um, oh no, actually I'll come on to that in a moment. First of all, I thought it would be interesting just to look at Easter 1916, um, not only in terms of what was going on in Dublin, by comparing deaths in Dublin to deaths among Dubliners serving in the British Army, just to get an idea of this being a period in which sacrifices are made for causes, but I wanted to stress that actually people are sacrificing themselves for different causes than those who died during the Rising. We just take two days of the Rising, which I've done this for every day in the book, but if we take two days, the days on which there are the heaviest num numbers of, the largest numbers of fatalities in Dublin, um, the rising dead uh, in total in Dublin on Thursday the 27th of April is 53. 15 of those are British military, 32 civilians and 7 rebels. Dubliners killed at the front is 55. 51 in France and Flanders, 3 in Mesopotamia and 1 in Kenya. Killed or died I should say, I think the 1 in Kenya died of illness. Um, and then Saturday, the day that the, the, the rising completely collapses, um, 78 rising dead, uh, 45 civilians, 21 British military and 12 rebels. Um, Dublin's war dead at the front is 70, all in France and Flanders. Now why is that important? Well, one of the things I was interested in you get this out when I, quite early on in the project, you, anecdotally I would find stuff of people saying, oh well of course the Rising was initially very badly received in Dublin, particularly in working class areas. Uh, and it said, well these, the, the people who were most hostile yeah. to the rebels were the so-called separation women, the women whose husbands were serving in British forces and they had a separation allowance. I wanted to try and quantify that, you know, to go beyond the anecdotal. And the way I did it was to, I, I just took a map and obviously I've got my database and everybody's linked to a road. And I thought, okay, let's just take the roads that immediately touch on the places where the rising happens. Not the roads off them, but the roads that immediately touch on the places where the rising happens. And I found that across the war, over a thousand men from those roads um, served in the British military across the whole war. Um, I know when 658 enlisted and 528 
were already serving when the rising happened. And if you assume that the spread of dates of enlistment is the same for the ones you don't know about as for those you do, of the roughly a thousand who were already serving, nearly 900 men from those roads were um, already serving. And 121 of them had already been killed. So people had already had those telegrams saying, your husband or your son or your brother or so on has been killed. Um, another 14 were killed at Hullock during the Rising, and another 170 killed later in the war. But if I, I think these numbers help you understand that if a group of men stand up on the steps of the GPO and declare independence and say they are, that, that they have gallant allies in Europe, meaning primarily Germany, Austria, Hungary, uh, and, and of course um, Turkey, then people who've got loved ones serving in the British forces are immediately going to see these rebels as allying with the people who are trying to, trying to kill their loved ones. So I think putting numbers on this goes beyond the idea that maybe there are one or two people who are um, outspoken and spit at the rebels as they're led off. But actually this is a very large number of people who have loved ones serving in British forces. And so the rebels immediately look like the enemy as soon as they, they make their declaration of independence. However, the lines are not always so starkly drawn. Uh, William Beaumont, um, first of all, got a number of people in this book who are called cro who I've called crossovers, and there aren't many of them. There are just a few more than a dozen, um, but I think they show you that the journeys that people navigated and the decisions they took during this period as to which side they were on could be quite complicated. So William Beaumont serves um, in British forces through the war. Um, he comes back, finds his brother Sean. Sean is actually a communist and is also uh, involved in um, Republican forces. And um, William Beaumont's initially not interested in any of that. He's a British veteran, he, he, that's who he sides with. But as the War of Independence develops, he becomes increasingly alarmed by the way some members of the British forces, the Black and Tans, Auxiliaries, are treating people in Dublin. And in particular, he's on a tram when the British soldiers come on, search people. He thinks they're not very um, gentlemanly towards the women on the, on the tram. Um, they also find in his pocket a notebook with instructions on how to take a machine gun apart, um, which was actually uh, his notebook from France, and he wasn't involved in Republican forces at all. Um, eventually he persuades them that he's a British veteran, he's not mixed up in this, but something clicks for him. He goes home and says to his brother, do you know what, I'd like to help you lot, I just don't like the way this lot are behaving, can I join the IRA? And his brother says, um, Actually, you can do something more useful, which is that you, as a British veteran, can get to know British forces in the city um, and uh, go out drinking with them, find out what their movements are, and become a spy. And he meets Michael Collins, and that's what he does. Uh, and Sean Beaumont actually claimed later that um, his brother had provided most of the names of the people that the IRA then targeted in Dublin in November 1920 as being British security operatives. Uh, well, we know that actually they, those names come from, came from a number of sources and I think Sean Beaumont's talking up his brother's role a little bit, but nevertheless, this is a man who just because of one thing that happened on a tram, it changed. Emmett Dalton is more complicated. Um, Dalton's from a middle-class Catholic family, actually born in the USA, but um, uh, uh, lived in Dublin from the age of three. Um, his uh, family was very much uh, Irish Parliamentary Party supporters, though a little bit hostile to the British forces. Uh, his father knew Joe Devlin, the Nationalist MP for West Belfast, and Emmett talked to Joe Devlin 
uh, about whether he should join up. And Joe Devlin said he should. He should join the British Army. That was the right thing to do for an Irish nationalist in 1914-15. So Emmett Dalton joins up um, uh, initially with the disapproval of his father. He, he turns up having joined up and his father throws him out and says, I won't be having any red coats in the house. And eventually his mother talks him round. Emmett Dalton uh, eventually finds himself uh, on the Somme in September 1916 uh, in the 9th Royal Dublin Fusiliers. He wins the military cross for his actions at the Somme um, and he is with Tom Kettle, the Nationalist MP, former Nationalist MP, when he's killed. So Dalton is there with this icon of constitutional nationalism when he's killed. Um, he then goes through the rest of the war, uh, it's not come up very well here, but he's, um, he's just pictured here when he's serving in the second Leinsters in February 1918 on the Western Front, he transferred from the Dublin Fusiliers, and these are all medalists who are in the, in the um, uh, second Leinsters. There's one military, uh, sorry, Victoria Cross winner in there, and Dalton, you can just see actually the white of his um, military cross ribbon. So how do we get from that Emmett Dalton to this Emmett Dalton in London in Michael, with Michael Collins in a carriage during the, the Anglo-Irish Treaty negotiations? Well, Dalton came back home and found his brother Charlie serving in the IRA. Dalton never explained this clearly, but he decided that actually Although, he'd done, although he thought the British Army was the right thing to join in 1914-15, um, the struggle had somehow changed. And he's a symbol of actually how middle class Catholic uh, opinion in Dublin had moved from being supportive of the Irish Parliamentary Party to being supportive of, of Sinn Féin. And Dalton, I think, was just the kind of person who believed in doing things about his beliefs, not just having beliefs. So the natural thing for Dalton to do is to get involved in the IRA. He becomes um, a very significant figure in training. Uh, he has a vast military expertise which they find useful. He also had two British officers uniforms and on one famous occasion he tried to um, break out he just went in pretending to be a British officer um, to break out uh, Sean McKeown, who was a Longford IRA figure who was um, who'd been imprisoned in, in Mountjoy. It was unsuccessful, but him and a man called Peter Goff uh, actually hijacked a British armoured car in Dublin and drove it into Mountjoy and tried to eventually talk, talk their way out. Dalton became such a mythical figure for the British that whenever anything happened in Dublin that involved some kind of subterfuge, the British forces would say Emmett Dalton was behind it. And he often, he quite often wasn't behind it. But he became a very significant figure in the IRA. Um, he was very pro-truce, and indeed, when uh, the Civil War began, Dalton used his contacts with the British Army and his knowledge of how to talk to British soldiers to obtain the field guns that the Irish Free State forces uh, used to shell the four courts, to shell out the anti-treaty IRA. So um, Dalton is somebody who very much symbolises that, that period of, um, of change. Um, he eventually leaves the uh, Free State forces, he resigns, uh, by which point he's a general, um, he resigns during the Civil War because he's angered by executions of prisoners um, by the Free State. He thinks that is not what the Free State should be about. Uh, has a fascinating life afterwards. He um, becomes a whiskey salesman. He's involved in film production. Uh, he um, ends up living in Radlett in Hertfordshire, which is quite near to where I live, and it's very leafy. The idea of an IRA general living and actually playing golf in Radlett, which is what he did, is just something I find hard to grasp. His daughter, Audrey, um, went off to uh, RADA, uh, 
um, to study um, acting, um, and then went out to America, and she was in, if you, sit, if you remember, things like Wagon Train and Bonanza, Audrey Dalton was one of the glamorous stars of those in the, in the, in the 50s. Emmett Dalton, you can find these on YouTube, gave really fascinating interviews um, in the 1970s about his attitude to the Easter Rising, where despite the fact that he'd been an IRA general, he, he felt and would always say the Rising was misguided, it achieved nothing, it shouldn't have happened. Um, I should add, during, um, during the Second World War, MI6 tried to recruit him. Um, I definitely think he could have been an Irish James Bond. There's a, there's a sort of fictionalised film to be made about him at Dalton, I think. Um, maybe by the people who make Peaky Blinders or something like that. So anyway, that's Dalton. And of course, uh, there is one more thing to say about Dalton. He was with Collins when he was killed. So Dalton is with Tom Kettle and Michael Collins when they're killed. The probably the, 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 the two iconic martyrs of different strands of, of Irish nationalism. There's one other man, final slide, one other man I want to mention. Now Michael McKay, um, I did mention him actually before when I, I gave my talk on, on Belfast Boys because I was working on this book then and his story was one that I found fascinating and it's where I conclude the book. Michael McKay was um, a member of the Fianna uh, from a Republican family, his uh, father was in the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Uh, so they're not just Irish volunteers, they're Irish Republican Brotherhood family. Uh, he, um, he's just joined the volunteers, age 15, uh, just prior to the rising. He's involved in gun running prior to the rising. He's at Rose Distillery during the whole of Easter week, fighting. He's captured by the British, who um, realise, he, he's by that point 16, they realise that and they keep him in, in uh, jail for a week and then essentially send him out with a clip round the ear, don't do it again. Um, he loses his job, not clear if he gets any kind of work immediately after the rising, and he probably didn't because what did he do in 1917? He joined the British Army. Um, he served through on the Western Front in the King's Own Royal Lancaster Regiment. Obviously liked military life because he stayed in after the war. In April, May 1922, he's home on leave. He meets Liam Mellows, who he'd known in the Fianna, and he deserts in the British Army. And you might think that in the coming struggle, this man who served in the Rising but then joined the British Army would be pro-treaty, but he's not. He's anti-treaty. And he goes into the Four Courts and becomes an instructor in the Four Courts for the anti-treaty Republican forces there. He's captured um, and, re and, uh, and um, put in prison by the uh, Free State Government and is held in prison for uh, about 15 months. He's let out at the end of... Uh, no, actually near 18 months. He's let out at the end of 1923, um, a little before the general release, but he's out. We don't really know what happens to him then. This, by the way, is, is his death certificate from um, uh, 1975. Uh, we don't know what happens to him until in the late 1930s, he shows up in the IRA pensions records. Now, when IRA pensions were first introduced, the, um, the forerunners of what is now Fina Gale said, well, to get a pension from the IRA, you've, you've, you've got to be, um, you've got to been out in the rising, uh, you've got to have been um, involved on the pro-treaty side in the Civil War. If you were out in the Easter Rising, but uh, were then anti-treaty, sorry, you're not getting a pension. Um, when De Valera comes in, in the mid-30s, this is classic port barrel politics, he just says, right, it, we're now making the pensions available to people who are anti-treaty because these are my supporters. 
So at that point, well, actually not immediately, because this change is made in 34, but in 1938, um, McCabe applies for a pension, saying, yeah, I was out in the rising, I was at the four courts during the Civil War, gets lots of people to testify to that. Um, his uh, address in 1938 is the Gold Coast Regiment of the British Royal West African Frontier Force. So having joined the British Army but then been anti-treaty, he's gone back into the British Army in the late 30s and he served in fact right through the Second World War in, in various parts of Africa um, before he's demobbed in 1946 and then he disappears from the records again until his death certificate um, which shows him as um, uh, single um, doesn't say uh, widowed, so and they, I can't find any, any children or any record of marriage. Occupation is interesting because this is a man, Barry, this is the Republic of Ireland in the mid 1970s, you know, this is during the Troubles. Occupation, retired British soldier. So he's still talking about that. That's, he's still, he's not ashamed of that past. Now, I don't know about Michael McKay. Um, was he just all over the place? Uh, did he just like military life? Um, or is there something else going on? I, for me, McCabe just tells you that people, ordinary people can be buffeted by history in different ways and they can make very different decisions. Uh, at different times, you know, he's, he's, because of his family connections he's involved in the rising, he's not got work, what else is he going to do? He joins the British Army, probably finds it quite exciting. Um, uh, and then he comes back during, as the Civil War is about to begin, and, so, and he's anti-treaty. You know, he's not a man for compromising. This is a man with some hard opinions, but maybe that was just down to the fact that he knew Liam Mellows from his time in the Fianna, and he sort of went with his friends. And then later on, he returned to the British Army uh, and uh, fought in a Second World War um, for a country that he'd not really wanted to compromise with uh, during the Civil War period. So, just an interesting, interesting tale. And um, I use the line that actually McCabe sums up the fact that during this uh, period, British and Irish soldiers could be both the worst of enemies and the best of comrades. Uh, and McCabe just sums that up for me because it's such a complicated story. Um, and uh, I've got to the point now, you know, when people say, if you could meet anyone from history. <laughs> uh, Michael McCabe, actually, I would love to ask him some questions about his experiences. So that's where I'll end. Thank you. Thank you.